Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Back in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 24 tonight. Tw chapter 23 was basically all about false prophets, and it lines up so well with Ezekiel chapter 13. 23 verse 1, God started off, he says, Woe to the pastors that scatter my sheep, that destroy my sheep. And the sheep, that, that's just the congregation of God. That's God's children. Saying, woe to the false preachers, the false prophets, that just, they just scatter them with false teaching, with traditions of men. He gives so many different ways that the false prophets, how, how they deceive people. They use those slippery, flattering, soothsaying words. Not teaching God's word, but what they say is so religious, it sounds so righteous. So people fall right into it. They say, oh, God gave me this great dream, or, or God told me to say this, God told me to say that. But God said, look, I never spoke to them. But that's what they say. They get you to think that they have such a close relationship with God that, wow, he's really religious. He talks to God right to him. He, he must be right. But they're just lying about it. And then they even get so caught up in their pride that they even begin to believe themselves that they actually are some type of prophet. So they, they get that. And that's just because it's Satan working, just getting that pride lifted up in them, causing the war, even worse, they're deceiving all kinds of people. But they're even deceiving themselves. And Jeremiah said, I, my bones shake because of the false prophets, because God is so good to us, and His Word is so pure and so filled with love and wisdom. But the false prophets don't teach the Word of God. They just teach out of their own heart. So Jeremiah, he just, his bones shake because of it. He's just so upset about it. But God said, look, don't worry. I will send you teachers that teach the Word of God straight on, exactly as it is written. And it says, by you learning the Word of God, you will have no more fear. You won't be dismayed. Because that's what the Word of God does for you. It gives you that real peace of mind that nothing else can ever give you. And we thank God for it. And at the, end, at the end of that chapter 23, God's saying, look, don't you say that I sent a burden on you. Because God doesn't send burdens. And he said, look, if you, you better not say that I sent a burden upon you. But if you do say I sent a burden, even after I told you not to say that, I will even forget you and I will forsake you. So don't go blaming God for anything. God does not send burdens. God only brings blessings. He made that very clear. You do not want to blame me for anything is what God says, or I'll show you how bad life can get. And we talked about at the end of last night, Jeremiah 24 is the, the foundation of the parable of the fig tree, something that absolutely has to be understood. And it's, it's so interesting. The information covered in this chapter goes basically all the way back nearly to the very beginning of this earth age. And goes all the way basically up to near the end of this earth age. It goes all the way from Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation 19. So um, only 10 verses, but it jam-packed with information. So let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for allowing us to understand and teach your word. And we thank you for giving us this building so we can fellowship in your name with others and so we can share the word of God with others. We just ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand your word. And we ask for your words to be spoken. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. So Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 1, and it reads, The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, that's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, had brought them to Babylon. <coughs> Verse 2. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. So this is two different sets of people. you got the good figs and the bad figs. Verse 3. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs very good, and the evil very evil, that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, so we can understand exactly what this is talking about here. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 3. Who are these good figs and who are these bad figs? Let's find out straight from our Father's Word. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and it reads, 
Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And you know from our studies in Revelation, the serpent is Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. The serpent, the, the devil, is Satan. It's all the same person. So the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. That means cunning, deceitful, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, that's Eve, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That's etz is tree in the Hebrew. And yes, God said, You can partake of any of the trees. Apple tree, orange tree. He didn't say, Don't eat the apples. That's not written. He said, You can partake of any of the trees of the garden. So Satan's saying, Isn't that what God said? Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. That's true. Verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And you need to check out this word touch in your Strong's Concordance. The word is naga. And it's a euphemism which means to lie with the woman. So that's what God said. He said, don't you go messing around with that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan, that is just another one of his names. He is the serpent. He's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's just different roles that he plays. And if you have any doubt of that, go read Ezekiel chapter 31, where it's, where it's speaking of Satan. It says how he was in the Garden of Eden and how, how his branches were, were, more, were spread out more than anyone else. He was, it says he was more beautiful than any of the other trees of the garden. So it's not a tree, it's just a metaphor. And it says that his heart was lifted up in, in itself. Remember, Satan, the most beautiful angel who was ever created. So that's who, that's who this is talking about, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's Satan. And God said to Eve, don't you touch it. Touch meaning to lie with the woman. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, liar. Satan always contradicts what God says. Verse 5. For God doth know that in the days ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan, real subtle, real cunning, trying to look. You'll, you'll be as gods if you do this, what I'm trying to get you to do. Your eyes will be open. Verse 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Remember, Satan, the most beautiful angel ever created. And this word pleasant, kamad in the Hebrew, in other places, in the, it is even translated into English as lust. So you know what we're talking about here. You're not ignorant of that, right? You can, you can understand what this is saying. And a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. The beginning of the, fair, of the parable of the fig tree is here. They took those fig leaves, and what they make? They didn't cover their mouths. Did, did they, if they would have eaten, an, if Eve ate an apple, she would have put it over her mouth. But no, they took those fig leaves and made aprons, meaning they covered their private parts. So you, you know what's happening here. Eve, Eve was seduced. Dude, she was beguiled by the serpent. And she lied with him. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Because they, they knew that they had the, the one law, the one commandment God gave, they broke it. So they, they know that God's going to know. They're scared now. Verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Verse 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11, And he, God, said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, or have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Verse 12, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat, blaming the woman. Verse, verse 13, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She was seduced. She lied with Satan. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. That's a, that's a thing of degradation, a statement of degradation. Verse 15, don't ever forget this verse. And I will put enmity, that means hostility, between thee and the woman. Remember, he's speaking to Satan. 
and between thy seed and her seed. Notice the capital S. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the seed, the capital S, the seed of the woman, that's going to bruise Satan's head. When Christ died on the cross, that sealed Satan's death once and for all. Satan's head will be bruised. He will be blotted out at the end of the millennium. But what does it say? It says that, and, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Meaning it would be the offspring of the serpent that would bring about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. His, his heel is being nailed to that cross. So if, if you can... If, you cannot deny the fact of this chapter, of this one verse. It makes it so simple. I will separate, I will put hostility between thy seed, speaking of the serpent, and the woman's seed. The serpent seed, bad figs. The woman's seed, good figs. Verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply, multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. She conceived. I don't have to tell you what that means to conceive. She conceived child. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now I want you to skip down to chapter 4, verse 1. Because so many people, they will just forget everything that they just read in chapter 3. And they'll go to verse 4, and they'll go to chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, and they'll say, oh no, everything you're saying is wrong. When it's obvious they've never even touched the strong concordance, never even considered going into the languages just a little bit. So I want to take you here so you can know exactly what this says. So you, so you can share with others. Genesis chapter 4 verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Cain would be the offspring of the serpent. But remember, she already conceived back in Genesis chapter 3 15. Verse 2. And she again, that's the key word, again bare his, his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And this word again, check it out in your strongs, it's yasop in the Hebrew. And it means to continue to do a thing. So yeah, Eve lied with Adam. She conceived and she bare Cain. But you see, Cain had already been conceived. He was already in the womb. So Cain and Abel were twins, same mom, different fathers. And it's so easy to tell because in Genesis chapter 5, you have the genealogy of, of Adam. Guess what? Cain's not there. Cain has his own genealogy in Genesis chapter 4. You even got a second witness of it, 1 Chronicles chapter 1. You have the genealogy of Adam again. Cain is not there. So it's so easy. Why isn't he there? Well, because Adam's not his father. The serpent was. Satan is Cain's father. And it's spelled out so easily. And I want to go to Matthew chapter 13 just to, to lay the foundation even a little more in case you had any question. So Matthew chapter 13, we're going to pick it up, verse 37. And, it, and this is the parable of the sower and the parable of the tares. And like I, as I mentioned last night, Mark chapter 4 says, look, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of God's parables. And it's this something else that's very, very important that just God just will just show you things if you're willing to dig it out. Matthew chapter 13, the first 23 verses, you have the word seed in the English mentioned a bunch of times, but the word is spiro, and it means to sow or to scatter. And it's talking, it is that's what it's talking about. It's talking about seeds of truth of God's word in the first 23 verses. But then when you get to verse 24, every time after that, the word the word seed. It's sperma in the Greek. And that means the male sperm. Showing you, look, this is talking about offspring. This is talking about what happened in the garden. And, and uh, right about verse 24, it's saying, look, an enemy came in the night and he, and he sowed tares among the wheat. Zawan in the Greek. And you see, they look ex the exact same at the start. Just how the Kenites, which Kenites means the offspring of Cain, that they look just the same as the tribe of Judah. But they are the wicked ones. They are the bad figs. And then the disciples didn't quite understand it. So that so then let me let me get there to Matthew chapter 13. The disciples didn't quite understand it. So they said, Look, do, look, Jesus, please declare unto us the parable that tears the field. So so Christ is going to explain it to them. Matthew chapter 13, verse 37. And it reads, He, this is Christ, answered and said unto them, 
He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That's the good figs. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. That's the bad figs. Who is the wicked one? I don't think I have to tell you. Let's go one more verse. Verse 39. If you had any doubt of who the wicked one is. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So God does not leave us wanting for this knowledge and this, of this information. If we, we're not going to go there, but if we were to go to Matthew chapter 23, God's speaking to the Kenites, the offspring of Cain, and He's saying, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And He said, Look, I sent prophets, I sent teachers, and all of, all of them, your offspring is responsible for all of their deaths. All the, all the way from righteous Abel, to Zechariah, son of Barcaius. Well, who killed Abel? Cain did, of course. You read of it in Genesis chapter 4. So and God is so good to us. To, you cannot deny the facts of God's Word. If you want to believe that Eve ate an apple, I guess go ahead. But that's not what we just read in God's Word, did we? That is a complete lie that Satan planted in the mind of churches. And so many people, that's just what they teach. They don't even go to check it out. They just say, oh yeah, Eve ate an apple. That's what happened. That's not what happened. The word apple was never even mentioned there. She, she touched the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Naga. She lied with the serpent. And the bad fig would came about. That would be Cain and his offspring would be called, called the Kenites. So let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 24. And even another place is Matthew or John chapter 8 where, where he says... We're, Christ is speaking to the Kenites and he says, Look, you are of your father the devil, and of the lust of your father you will do. So God does not leave us wanting to know exactly what happened in the garden and for us to know the parable of the fig tree. So let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 4. Now that you know who the, who the good and the bad figs are, the good seed, the offspring of Eve and Adam through which Christ would come, the bad fig, the offspring of Satan, the Kenites. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 4. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place unto the land of the Chaldeans for their good. And do you remember what we've been learning in this book of Jeremiah? God saying, Look, the, the king of Babylon is coming. To us in prophecy, the false Christ is coming. But God's saying, look, don't try to stop it. It's going to happen. Just go, just watch it happen, observe, but don't you worship him. Verse 6. And also, like it says in Mark 13, God says, look, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, you get out of Jerusalem for your good, or else they would try to get you to worship him there. Verse 6. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good. Remember, this is the good fig. And I will bring them again to this land. And I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. And when did, when did they return? It was the year of 1948 when Jerusalem became a nation again. This prophecy was fulfilled. Not too long prior to 1948, there was only about 8,000 total people even in Jerusalem. It was, there wasn't hardly anybody there. But what happened in 1948, the, in the three years after 1948 when Jerusalem became a nation again, the following three, the following three years, 700,000 people of the tribe of Judah came back to Israel. And that, that, this prophecy was fulfilled. God said, look, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring a good fig, fig back. And that's what happened in 1948. So that gives us a timeline that that was when the shoot was set out of the fig tree. And you're going to understand exactly why that's so important when we end this lecture in Mark chapter 13. But also, never forget what it says in Revelation chapter 2, 9, and chapter, and chapter 3, 9. It says, look, there are many that claim to be of the tribe of Judah, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. That's the tares. That's the bad fig. And what, and what we're going to read here soon in Jeremiah 35... It's the house of Rechab. And you know from 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, the house of Rechab are the Kenites. And that's what it's all about in Jeremiah 35, the house of Rechab. And they said, look, we were scared of Nebuchadnezzar and his army. 
So we dwell at Jerusalem. And the Kenites dwell among the tribe of Judah, mixing themselves in. To where if you didn't understand God's word, you would just think they were all of the tribe of Judah. But they do lie, and they are of the synagogue of Satan. The only two churches that God was pleased with out of seven in Revelation, they teach who the Kenites are. That's Smyrna and Philadelphia. So let's go another verse. Verse 7. And I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Remember, this is talking about the good fig. Now verse 8. And as the evil figs, this is saying, well, I'll just read it. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and then that dwell in the land of Egypt. So what this is saying, that just like the bad figs, what's going to happen to them? The same thing is going to happen to Zedekiah. Verse 9, And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse, in all places whither I shall drive them. And that, that was prophesied even back in Genesis chapter 4. We didn't read it. But after Cain kills Abel, God said, look, you are going to be a, you are cursed. You can, you are cursed that the ground will never produce for you. And you will be a vagabond throughout all the earth. Saying, look, I'm going to spread the Kenites out. But where is the main place that they dwell? Jeremiah 35. The main place is Jerusalem. Verse 10 to complete this chapter. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them, till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and their fathers. Well, there's a whole lot in this verse. What's the sword, the famine, and the pestilence? That's the second, the third, and the fourth seal of Revelation chapter 6. The things that lead up to the coming of the false Christ. Because remember, six trumps, six seals, six vial. That's when the false Christ is cast down into this earth. And it says that they will be consumed from off the land. What's the consumer? That's the fourth and the final stage of the locust. The fallen angels that Satan brings with him is cast out of heaven with him. When that sixth vial is poured out on the great river Euphrates and it's dried up to where there's no separation between truth and Babylon and confusion anymore. It's all confusion at that time because there's only a very small number of people that will not worship the false Christ. Now I want to go to Mark chapter 13 to finish this study. I said that we were going to, this chapter 24 of Jeremiah it covered all the way from the beginning, back in Genesis 3. Now we're going to go all the way to the end. And we're, you're going to understand why it's so important to know when that prophecy was fulfilled, that the, the fig tree generation began in 1948, when that prophecy was fulfilled, that Jerusalem became a nation again. And the tribe of Judah came back. So Mark chapter 13. We're going to pick it up in verse 19. And the verses 9 through 13, Christ saying, Look, you're going to be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan. But don't you premeditate what you will say. Because it's not you that speak, but it's the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. So Mark chapter 13, we're going to, we'll go ahead and pick it up verse 19. Mark 13, 19, and it reads, For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And what's the subject of this chapter? The arriving of the false Christ. He's saying this is the greatest tribulation that there ever has been or that there ever will be. Verse 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And you learn in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, that time is shortened to a five-month period. So God's saying, look, Satan is so subtle, so good at deception. If I didn't shorten the days, even God's elect would be deceived. Every single person in the flesh on the earth when Satan's here, they would worship him if I didn't shorten the time is what Christ is saying. Verse 21, And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. When everyone says, look, Jesus Christ has returned, but you're still in a flesh body, don't believe it. It's the false Christ. Just like it says in Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 11, he arrives prosperously and peacefully, coming with flatteries. Just, we'll give anybody anything. All you got to do is worship him. Verse 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise 
and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Like it says in Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, Satan can bring lightning down from heaven any time that he wants, and he deceives people by the miracles that he performs. But if someone says, Lo, here is Christ, here is there, believe him not. Verse 23, But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Every prophecy, everything you ever need to know is written in this Bible. The only question is, have you read it? Verse 24, but in those days, after that tribulation, after the tribulation of Antichrist, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Verse 26, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. The true Christ finally arrives after that reign of the false one. Verse 27, And then shall he, gather, and then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. God gathers his elect and also the remnant that we talked about in chapter 23. The God's elect remnant that all throughout time brought God's word of truth down. He gathers them and he brings them with him. As we read in Revelation chapter 19, Christ brings that army with him. Verse 28, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Christ didn't say, well, maybe you should learn this, maybe not. He said, you learn a parable of the fig tree. That's why it's so important to understand all this. Understand how it started, what actually happened in the garden. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And that happened in 1948 when the parable of the fig tree, the, the generation of the fig tree began. When that prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 40 or chapter 24 was fulfilled and Israel became a nation again. Verse 29. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. When you see that prophecy come to pass, when you see Israel become a nation again, you know that it's getting real close for time for the false Christ to arrive and after that for the true Christ to arrive. Verse 30, a very important verse. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all of these things be done. The generation that began in 1948 will not pass until all prophecy is fulfilled. Getting pretty far into it, 71 years into that final generation. So we watch. Verse 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God's word remains true forever. On into the millennium and into the eternity. It is always true. The Old Testament is just as true today as it ever has been. Verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Verse 33. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. We know the season, but we don't know the day, the hour, or the year. But we know we're 71 years into that final generation. Verse 34. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants. That's all of us. We are God's servants. And to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Oh, that's what we're to do, to be a watchman. Watch what's going on and sound the alarm. Tell the people that the false Christ is coming. Verse 35. Once again, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Don't be like those five foolish virgins in Matthew 25. For when, when the false Christ came, they heard that Jesus Christ had arrived, so they, they believed him. They went out to worship him. They didn't have any oil in their lamps, meaning they didn't have any truth. So, that, so they were deceived and they worshipped the false one. Because they, they didn't get around to studying God's word. They didn't have any truth. Verse 37 to complete. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Christ telling us, look, you keep your eyes peeled. And you pay attention to everything that's going on in the world. Because God gave us these prophecies. He said, look, when there's war and rumors of wars, the time is not yet. But when it's world peace... When that one world system gets set up, 
you know that it's almost time for the false Christ to arrive. Who arrives and, and he heals the deadly wound to the one world system, perfecting world peace, ending world hunger. All you got to do is worship him and you can have anything you could ever want. So God does not leave us wanting to tell us the, the prophecies and the knowledge that we need. So I hope that you, after studying this, that you don't believe that Eve ate an apple. Because we just read Genesis chapter 3. That's not what happened. You got good figs and you got the bad figs. And what did Genesis 3.15 say? God speaking to the serpent. He said, look, I put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. There are two different seeds. You have, this, you have the seed line that Christ came through of Adam and Eve. And you have the seed line of the serpent. That's the Kenites. And remember, 1 Chronicles 2.55, we just mentioned it. They, they were already being scribes for Judah. Worked their way up to, to being scribes, to, to, taking, to even uh, translating the Bible. So you watch these new translations out here. Because the Kenites are still very working hard even today. That's why, that's why it's so important to have a strong concordance. To which is so, makes it so easy to just go back to the original Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. So you know exactly what God said. Because even, even the original 1611 King James, a super long note at the beginning, the translator saying, Look, this isn't perfect by any means. We did the very best we could. But you've got to be able to check it out for yourself to know exactly what God's saying. The parable of the fig tree. What did Christ say in Mark 13? He said, you learn the parable of the fig tree. And this generation shall not pass till all of these things be fulfilled. So just like he said, watch and pay attention and sound the alarm to others. So we can be ready and so we can make sure others are ready for that coming of the false Christ. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. We thank You for Your written Word and for giving us the knowledge of the prophecies in Your Word. And we thank You for allowing us to understand and to share Your Word with others. And thank You again for this building, for giving us a place we can come and fellowship in Your name and share the Word with others. And we just ask You to continue to guide us with Your Holy Spirit so we can be pleasing to You and so we can help to learn more and so we can, not, not for just us, but so we can share the truth with others. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This was recorded at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Burden, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisk on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless. June 13th, 2019.